So I want to read to you a moment in the life and ministry of Jesus. It's very, very significant. Matthew tells the story. Mark tells the story. Luke tells the story. It mattered to all those disciples. They all remembered this moment. And this is how Luke tells it. A certain ruler asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your mother and father. He replied, I have kept all these since my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, there is still one thing lacking. Sell all that you own, distribute the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when he heard this, he became sad, for he was very rich. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said to Jesus, Then who can be saved? He replied, What is impossible for mortals is possible for God. Then Peter said, look, we left our homes and followed you. And Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of kingdom of God who will not get back very much more in this age and in the age to come eternal life. And that's from our Lord Jesus. Amen. To be a Christian. Wait a minute now. Amen. Okay, just want to make sure you had your ears on. This is sermon number one for you now, not sermon number two. To be a Christian is to love Jesus. Can we keep it simple? I don't want to make being a Christian, being active and participating faithfully in a church, complex. This is not calculus. It's math 101. This is not ch chess. This is checkers. To be a Christian is to love Jesus. To be a Christian is to live for Jesus. That's what it means. If we're doing our very best to love Jesus and to live, Jesus, live for Jesus, we're on a Christian path. If anything that we do is not motivated by love for Jesus, motivated by living for Jesus, that's wrong. And that's a sin. You don't need to read dogmatics or church doctrine to figure that out. It really is that simple and complete and easy to be a Christian man, a Christian woman or boy or girl is to look at Jesus and what you know about Jesus is to love him and to live for him and as best you can follow him. It is really absolutely that simple. And last week and next week and right here, right now, what I'm talking to you about is loving Jesus. Last week I stood here, or Brad did, and talked about the woman who came forward and poured an entire bottle of very expensive perfume on Jesus' feet. Mary did that. She was a person who got it right. She saw her last opportunity to love Jesus. She had listened to him preach. She listened to him talk. She listened to what he had to say. She listened and knew that he was about to go to Jerusalem and that he would not come back, that he would not survive. The Pharisee and scribe and religious leader would nail his hide to the barn, that it wasn't long before he would be standing for Pontius Pilate. And Mary knew this was her last chance to express her love for Jesus. And she got it right. She didn't care what it cost. She didn't care what people said. 
She didn't care what people thought about her. She threw caution to the wind and poured out a very expensive gift on Jesus. She didn't even know what Jesus would think or say. And Jesus said, do not criticize this woman. If you want to do something for poor folks, you've got the poor with you always and you will not always have me. She did this because she was aware that my burial is not far from this day. And everywhere the gospel is preached, I don't care in Georgia, wherever in the world the gospel is preached, Mary's story is told because she got it right. She understood. She looked around the table and there sat her brother Lazarus who was graveyard dead and was alive again. And maybe more important, Mary realized that she once was dead and now she's alive again. Christ raised her up. Are you aware? I know you've got to be aware. You can die and still be breathing. I know people who've given up on life and quit on life and they get up and they pour their cup of coffee and you feel sorry for them. Mary was one of those people that Christ raised up. She understood from Jesus that she was forgiven by God. Do you know what it means to be forgiven by God? What that feels like? She understood and learned from Jesus how important it was that she forgive other people. Do you know what it feels like to lay down that burden and to not be angry anymore? To lay down your warring heart and be able to live with a peaceful heart? She found purpose. Jesus talked to her about cross-bearing and sacrifice and service, and she found purpose in life and realized she didn't just have to stay in the kitchen to fulfill her purpose in life. So she loved Jesus and she got it right now we meet a man who got it wrong he just got it wrong I feel sorry for this man Matthew Mark Luke they all remember him Matthew says he was young and the word that Matthew uses in Hebrew to say this man was young indicates that he was quite young he probably wasn't 30 years old 30 years old and he already had it made 30 years old and his car was already paid for. He didn't have a mortgage. 30 years old and he could do what he wanted to. That's pretty sweet. Can I get an amen on sweet? I mean, that's pretty sweet. Matthew said, this man wasn't 30. Luke says he was rich. Did you hear me read that? That he was rich? Actually, Luke doesn't say that he was rich. Luke says he was very rich. Do you know the difference? One has cloth upholstery, the other has leather. One says SLT, the other says Denali. Do you understand? He was Denali. He was very rich. I like what Mark says. I almost came this close, just that close, to reading through the story for Mark instead of Matthew or Luke. Because in Mark, what Mark says is that Jesus looked at the man and listened to the conversation they had and that Jesus loved him, that Jesus loved him. And I'm guessing, and your guess is as good as mine, that Jesus knew him, that this wasn't the first conversation they had, that Jesus knew where he lived and what neighborhood he was in, that Jesus knew his income, where he hung his hat, Mark says that Jesus loved him. And he came to Jesus with a question. It's a good question, but it's one of those questions that gives him away. He said, teacher, please tell me, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Now, I don't think that he was thinking about getting to heaven. Most people in their 20s are not thinking about the pearly gates or the streets paved with gold. That may have been in the back of his mind, but he had an itch that wealth couldn't scratch and popularity and power couldn't scratch. And he wanted to find a life that mattered. He wanted a life that gave him gladness and joy. He wanted to put his head on the pillow and know that the life he was living was pleasing to God. That's what he wanted. 
And so he came to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And right there, to quote Uncle Remus, is where he dropped his molasses jar. You don't do anything to inherit something. It's a gift. It's a gift. When my dad grew old and he knew his time was short, He went to his gun cabinet and out of the gun cabinet picked up a Browning shotgun that's extremely expensive. I would never buy such a gun because if I did buy such a gun and Lisa found out how much I paid for the gun, she would shoot me with the gun (laughs) and be justified in doing it. But he had it. And he came and he put it in my hands and he said, I want you to have this. I said, Dad, I could never deserve this. He said, I know. (laughs) You could never deserve this. But your brother doesn't hunt, and your sister can't shoot, and I got to give it to somebody. And I love you, and I want you to have it. And I still have it. And I'll always have it. It was a gift. And this man came forward, and he clearly indicated he didn't understand religion and God at his toenail depth because he thought he could earn it and win it and buy it and get it and God's love is just not that way and life is not that way God's love for you is a gift you cannot earn it or deserve it or ever lose it Because it's not about who you are, it's about who God is. It's called grace. And Jesus didn't want to get into a theological argument with this young, rich, powerful man. So he just threw him back on himself and said, let's talk about the commandments. What are the commandments? Well, be faithful in marriage. Don't steal, don't lie, don't hurt people. Love your mom and your daddy. Those are the commandments. Jesus said, take hold of those things, keep hold of those things, and they'll lead you to life. He said, Master, I'm on the dean's list for keeping commandments. I'm on the dean's list. I have a 4.0. And he'd done well. But I, I need to interject that he had missed the most important commandment. Do you know what the first commandment is? The first commandment, the very first commandment, the very first one, You shall have no other gods before me. Just me, said God. Just me. Not anything else. Not anybody else. Your life, said Moses on behalf of God, shall revolve around God, be oriented about your devotion to God, and no other one but God. And he didn't have that one figured out because his life revolved around his Charles Schwab account, and what he could buy, and where he could go, and what people thought of him, and he couldn't let it go, couldn't let it go. Jesus said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell everything that you have. Try to hear this. Go sell everything that you have. The Denali truck, all of it, the house, everything. And come and follow me. And he couldn't do it. I hurt for him. I'm not mad at him. I'm really not mad at him. I hurt for him. I'm sad about him. That he couldn't let go. And follow Jesus. When I started into the ministry. If Jesus had come to me and said Don. Sell all you have. And come and follow me. It would have been a red Vega GT and a hunting rifle, and that's it. I, my net worth wasn't $4,000. Didn't matter. Come and follow me. Give up everything. Come follow. And he couldn't do it. Now, this is not a prescription for everyone. When I go see my doctor, Dr. Holbrook, he actually takes my temperature and examines me and blood pressure and all the other things, then he gives me a prescription. He doesn't just tear off the same prescription for everybody. 
So Jesus may not be saying to you, in fact, I'm guessing that Jesus is not saying to you, sell everything you have and go into the ministry. If Jesus is saying that to you, may I encourage you to do it right away. Do it right away. But everything that Jesus says, every prescription that he offers that brings healing to our hearts and lives has some sacrifice in the bottle of medicine. There is no way to love Jesus and have your cake and eat it too. At some point, we're called to sacrifice and serve and give ourselves completely away. And this man couldn't do it. I can't, it breaks my heart that I cannot tell you his name. Was his name Joseph or Reuben or Samuel? Would there be churches named after him? What difference might his life have made if he had been able to answer Jesus' call and give it all away to the poor and spend his life as a devoted follower of Jesus? What difference his life had made? I need to say to you as clearly as I know how, it is possible to absolutely throw your life away, make absolutely no difference in the world that you live in. It is absolutely possible to achieve all your personal goals of wealth and hang diplomas on the wall and at the end of the day really not find joy or gladness or fulfillment in what you've done. There are people who do it every day. I was recently at a golf course we'd finished playing. It was one of the drier days. I was sitting there watching. Did you notice that there were shootings in Aurora? I think it was Aurora, Illinois. Did you? I think it's a community outside Chicago. And the reporter was talking about the police officers who ran into the gunfire to help people. And several of those officers were shot. And this fellow that I've known for quite a while said, that's what I wanted to do. I said, what do you mean that's what you wanted to do? I wanted to be a police officer is what I wanted to do. But I never did it. And this doesn't happen to me very often. I honestly did not know what to say. Jesus once said, take up your cross and follow me. And whoever tries to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for my sake and for the gospel will find it. And it is through sacrifice and listening to Jesus that we find life. I look over my shoulder, and it's in those moments when I absolutely was able, through the grace and mercy of God, to let go of what I thought was so wonderful and so great that God actually elevated my life and helped me to love more deeply and to care more deeply. There was a time in my life in Covington, Georgia, little county seat town. I wanted to be the, I always wanted to be the pastor of a county seat town. You know, big fish, little bowl, everybody knows you, fun. I was having an absolute blast. It was just great. And then God in his own way came to me and said, I want you to go to Honduras. And I thought, I don't want to go to Honduras. I want to go to the Waffle House and to the barbecue restaurant. God said, go to Honduras. I want to show you a different part of God's world. What a difference it's made in my life in ways that I cannot begin to describe to you. I ask you to think about what God is calling you to do, what God is challenging you to do, what Christ needs you to do, where he's calling you to walk away from what looks like roses. Jesus did not say, come and follow me and the rest of your life is going to be a lot like a root canal and then do that come and follow me and find life and make a difference make a contribution not a withdrawal let your life be given for something that's what Jesus called people to but the man walked away sad and it gave Jesus an opportunity to talk about the danger of wealth and wealth can be dangerous it can be he said, it's harder to get somebody who is rich into the kingdom of God. It's hard. It's easier to get a camel through the eye of a needle. 
It's easier to drive a Cadillac through a revolving door than it is to get a rich person to see that life is not found in wealth and money and the things that money can buy. Now, don't misunderstand me. I like the things that money can buy. There was a day when I'd give a hoot and rain barrel about money. I didn't care. There was gas in my truck and a place to go hunting and fishing. I was fine. Then I picked up this thing called a golf club. And some guys in my church took me not to a municipal golf course, but to a private golf course. And I didn't carry my bag. I put it on a cart. In fact, a young man came out to the cart and took my bag and put it on the cart. And the grass was green and the greens were smooth. And I thought, oh, so this is what money will buy. I need to go talk to my financial advisor. But things that money won't buy, not joy, not great family life, Not a good, solid marriage, not friendship. Not that feeling that you get when you lay your head on the pillow that the day was well spent. Won't buy that. Some things that money just won't buy. And he went away sad. And it makes me think, do you you know the poet Robert Frost? Do you know him? Do you know the poem, The Road Not Taken? Two roads diverged in a yellow wood and sorry I could not be one traveler and travel both long I stood and I thought to myself this poor man had an opportunity would you please think about this he had an opportunity to spend every day with Jesus and he would rather be at the country club what is God calling you to do what is Christ calling you to do Where is the sacrifice that Christ is asking you to make so that you really can be a part of God's kingdom? Most of you know, I hope all of you know, that at the end of June, I'm going to be good for nothing. I can't wait to be good for nothing. Some say I've already achieved it. And so I've spent some time looking over my shoulder about when I decided and started to go into the ministry way back in the 1970s I thought about this when I graduated from college I thought well maybe I should be an attorney I could be an attorney I mean I'm doing now what attorneys do and I knew an attorney who was doing fine and I even went to him university and toward the law school and spoke to some of the professors and thought maybe I should apply. I was sharing that with a friend of mine in the church where I was active, the Skyland Methodist Church. And the lady in the church that loved me and cared for me was like a grandmama or a mama to me, heard what I was saying. And she walked up to me when I finished the conversation and she said, if you ever go into a courtroom, I hope to the Lord that you are wearing an orange jumpsuit. That's what she said to me. You need to go get your Bible and go preach to people. And I thought to myself, I don't want to do that. I want to make money. I want to get girls. Do you know any girls who say, oh, you're going to be a preacher? Let's go out. (laughs) Trust me, I know that game. But I prayed about it. And here I am, all these years later, here I am, pleading my case to you for Christ. When I made the decision to go into the ministry, the same lady came up to me and hugged my neck, and she said to me, you are going to have a wonderful life. She said, I promise you, you're going to have a wonderful life. Because the best and finest people in every community go to church. All the best people, she said, go to church. That's where you find the best people. You're going to have a wonderful life. And every time I walk into the sanctuary and look at you, I realize she was right. She was right. She was right. You lack one thing. 
Make a sacrifice. Find something better than glitter and gold and give yourself completely, wholeheartedly, without reservation to Jesus Christ. And you will be so blessed by God in this world and in the world to come. Wow. Let's bow our heads. Almighty God, we struggle with the call to sacrifice and give ourselves entirely to you. The world hypnotizes us and our imagination plays tricks on us. Tell us again that Christ loves us and died for us and knows just where to lead us. Tell us again that life is found in absolute, complete devotion to Christ and to his kingdom. In our Lord's name we pray it. Amen.